Okay. Alrighty, so we'll uh, take our time here in the next little bit to focus on the scriptures. Um, you can see the title here. I'm not going to make the uh, comment that I always make, how bizarre this stuff happens. Okay, I just did it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, for those that got to sit through the adult class, uh, maybe some of this will resonate. Um, it is always impressive how many other verses you can use. And uh, that's just the nature of God's word. It's very in-depth and very, uh, very deep. So, Okay, so we're going to talk today about enduring with patience. And there are lots of things that are happening in this world and in our lives uh, that this topic comes to mind quite frequently. And uh, I want to start out here in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. I think uh, many times we might end up with this text, but I do want you to think of this text when we come to the end. Hopefully it will all tie together. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings, clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now there's a lot of context that should go with this because as we see at the beginning, the word therefore, and we talk about that a lot, it connects to chapter 11. If we were to finish out chapter 11, it speaks of all of those that have been mentioned that really are examples for us that have carried the faith, that had stuck with God's plan, and they made a tremendous amount of sacrifice and effort to hang on. And if you take a few moments and want to go back there, I do want to reference in that chapter, uh, verse 34, we won't go there, but in there is a phrase that I think comes up quite frequently, and it's in the version I was reading, it's stated this way in verse 34 of Hebrews 11, made strong out of weakness. And I think uh, sometimes we hear the phrase, meekness is not weakness. The idea is that in order for us to endure, in order for us to carry through the challenges that come in our lives, we have to recognize that God can give us strength in our weakness, that he can bring us through, but we have to look to him. We have to lean on him and trust in him. And we'll speak to those things as we go along. I also want to say back at uh, verse 2 here, looking to Jesus. And we will want to remember that as we go through this. The things that Jesus did as a human being, as a person on this earth, in the condition that we are, is the ultimate example. And if we can bring those to mind as we uh, go through these verses, it will help understand this endurance, this uh, having the patience to get through the things that are set before us. So in this uh, lesson today, how do we prepare? The idea that we need to make steps to do things. We're going to talk about commitment in serving God. Uh, we're going to talk about self-discipline. Conditioning our heart and our mind to get through these things. And the word nutrition is really just about the spiritual food, and there was some discussion this morning in the adult class about spirituality. How do we feed that? How do we build our faith? How do we set ourselves up for success? And trying to think about how God has set things up and the order of things, how do we plug in and make the effort to get the result that He wants from us? He wants to give us eternal life. He wants to give us the kingdom. What do we do to do that? So hopefully we'll bring those things to bear. So starting out with commitment, the serving God, I wanted to start with Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, 
a little context here, Joshua is basically trying to reset <laughs> the people there. They've really gone off the beaten path, as we say. And this worshiping other gods was something that was always prevalent around the people of God. Because that's the, the reality of life, right? We all have choices. And in this context, the people were being challenged here. If you think, and it's an interesting phrase, if you think it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, that's an interesting way of saying it, isn't it? Nobody does something to be evil. That's typically kind of against our normal, right, way of processing things. I guess we could always find the exceptions. But generally speaking, we all think we're doing good. We all think we're doing the right thing. We're all trying to choose the right thing. But here it's stated that, hey, I'm calling you out. If it is evil in your, in your eyes to serve the living God, then you've got to still make a choice. I'm not going to let you off the hook. You need to pick who you're going to serve. And then he just flat, flat out says at the end, but as for me and my house, and this is kind of how we have to come to this, right? Because we know we're not going to make people accept the kingdom or the message or save themselves. We can't make them do that. We want to sometimes. We're compelled and we want to, to encourage, but we don't make people do these things. And Joshua made a statement. It was very bold, but he said clearly, I'm going to choose this path. And again, thinking about the examples that we can look to, this is another reference to that. Understanding that we always have a choice. In this context, the other gods. What do the other gods tell the people? Why would that be appealing? Those are all the things that we need to consider. And in our lives, what are the things that draw us away from God that we think are better, potentially? Stuff to think about. So this commitment, we carry this on in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Very wise man wrote these words, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Who's going to make your path straight? Is it me? No. It's going to be God. Why? Because God has the plan. He has the result that we want. We want eternal life. We want no tears, no sorrow. We want the life that's promised. And it's God that will set those paths. Now the choice comes down to, am I going to trust and believe in that path? Am I going to take those steps? Am I going to commit to that path? And why does he speak with all your heart? Do not lean on your own understanding. Well, we know in other references, the heart is deceitful, right? That same heart can help you choose the wrong path, can help you commit to other gods, can help you do the things that will take you away from the result that God wants for all of us. In all your ways, acknowledge him. We're going to speak about that acknowledgement. Acknowledging what? We're going to talk about that. In Romans 10, 10 through 13, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him, well, excuse me, believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The idea that we can confess and say these things can bring salvation is a choice that we have to make. And it's a condition that we're all in. There's no exceptions here. The same Lord is over all. Now we've talked about other gods. We've talked about the opportunity to serve and do and choose other things that are not godly. But we can See that this message says, focus on the true God. Believe. Be justified. Right size and line up with who the living God is. And get your mouth saying the right things and get your choices lined up. Confess this truth. You've got to say it in order for you to actually take action. Sometimes we kind of skip that step. 
right? When we, when we put the words out there, we write things down. I mean, we use email, right? Why, why is email dangerous? Because people save it. And they go, oh, you said that. And they go, yeah, I remember you said that. When we say things, people remember what we say. And maybe we forget that or we get uh, cavalier in what comes out of our mouth, guilty. But the point is, is that that's where we start expressing what we believe and we have to take action on that. We have to back it up with our, our, our actions. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. What is the shame that we're talking about? It's the rejection that was spoken of this morning in the adult class, realizing that we're sitting here, we've all got the truth, and yet the parable says some aren't going to be ready. And Christ is going to say what? I don't know you. The, the door would be shut. So we, we, we encourage that not to scare you, but to remind you that this isn't something that's a, a myth, something that's not true. It's to remind us that we all have this choice that we have to make, and we have to put it in front of us. Moving on to self-discipline, dealing with the heart and the mind. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. And yeah, we all know this. If there's a race set up, and we're sitting there, and we're going, well, I want that prize. Well, you got to get in the race. They don't give the prize to the ones that are standing off to the side watching. Now, we might be cheering and think that's great for that person, but the point here is, is that you have to get in the race. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. And yes, that's the risk that we all take when we say the truth and we speak it to people. We have to not be hypocritical. We have to be able to uh, uh, set an example with not just what we say, but how we act on those things that we say. This idea of self-control is where we work with it in our, our minds, right? Because that's where all of the behaviors, all the things that come out, they start right here. And when we condition ourselves, just like an athlete, it's a, an effort of focus. It's an effort of saying, okay, what is the result I want? I want to win that prize. Okay, what does it take to do that? And then making those steps, exercising the way you work that process. We... We, some of us probably have watched some of the Olympics, and you see some amazing things. Well, those people just didn't wake up someday and say, oh, I'm going to go and be in the Olympics, and I'm going to win a gold medal. Uh, that has been a very long, enduring, and challenging process for them because they want that prize, and it doesn't just go to anybody. It goes to the one that's the best. Don't do things aimlessly. Paul reminds us here, don't forget why you're doing what you're doing. And that's a big part of enduring. It's a big part of working through is we can get distracted. We can get pulled away from what we should be doing. And we have to stay focused on those things so we can win that prize. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and in Christ Jesus. We can't just say that we've already got it. Paul right here, he says, he reminds us of that. We can speak it, we can understand it, but until it actually is given, we don't have it. And he puts the action in place. He moves forward, puts that prize, puts it in front of him. A lot of times we can get bogged into, I'm tired, I don't know what to do next, I'm not sure what to do. Well, the scripture is full of action items, things that we need to move. And I think uh, Don brought it up this morning. What was that phrase you brought up out of that song? 
Love is not a feeling, but an act of your will. This is an effort thing. We have to put what God has said in front of us, and we have to take action on that. There are emotions. There are feelings. That's fine. But when we actually start putting in the steps that we need to, as Paul's mentioning here, straining forward to what lies ahead, put that effort in. The reward is great. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 10, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. We toil and we strive. Yeah, this, this opportunity, this gift that God has promised isn't something that's just handed out without some effort. And that was, again, discussed in the adult class today, that word works. And so many people kind of cringe and <laughs> shudder a little bit. Oh, I, I got to do something? Yeah, there's something that has to be done. In order to get this prize, you've got to exercise your mind. You've got to put yourself in that process and make that effort. Again, the parable of the ten virgins. We have to put that in the forefront of our minds and make those steps so that we're ready. When Christ comes, we want to hear that wor those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. It's a priority, right? We have to put what God is going to put emphasis on for ourselves. That's not focusing on things that won't bring this salvation, but focusing on what God is expecting us to do. David has some words for us uh, in some of his writings here in Psalm 62, 5 through 8. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. You can find many texts that David speaks of like this, but... I think we can just go through this and see a very important aspect of this process of committing self-discipline. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. Choice. My hope is from him. Choice. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. Choice. Do I need to go through every one? The point is, is that you can choose this or you cannot. But if you choose it, then these things become real. That's what a living God can do for you. And David understood this. David was surrounded by challenges. There's so many things that we're, we're grateful for, for the record, that tells us some of the things that he dealt with. He's in the same condition, or was, that we are in. These are the challenges that came up. And the example and the words that he put together to help cope and work through those problems are there for us. But it's a choice. It doesn't just happen because you read it, and for the moment you think, oh, that makes me feel good. <laughs> we have to take action. We have to look at it and say, okay, what's really being said here? And I have to make a choice. That's an individual step that fits into what we're speaking of today. Moving on to nutrition, spiritual food to build your faith. 2 Timothy 3.16, for many of us, common text, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Okay, all scripture. What does that mean? Well, there's 66 books in the Bible. There's a lot of information. So sometime we're going to have to sit down and commit to learning and reading and understanding what that is. That's going to have to happen. And we want that because it's inspired of God. And what does it give you? The doctrines, the things that you're supposed to know. It helps prove out things. It helps correct things. Everyone sitting in this room is carrying a wound. You have a wound. We all know it. That's the condition we're in. We're all failing. We're struggling. We're all sinners. So we all have to work at making these corrections, making these steps so that we can overcome that wound. It's tearing us down. For instruction in righteousness. Who's righteous? That the man of God may be complete. That's our goal. We want to please God. We want to be an example of Him, reflect His light. We want to put on that man thoroughly equipped for every good work. And there's that word, work. It isn't something that we float around and just, it's just going to happen. We're going to have to put something into this to get something back. We have to put on this whole process. And the scriptures help us with that. They have the instruction and the guide, guidance that we need. Back to David, and in Psalms 119, 12 through 16, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. Sound like confession? In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And here we are. All of these things David has wrote down, they're true. They're the things that we can do. And yet I can tell you from my own personal experience, there's a lot of things here that are very challenging to do. There's some self-discipline. There's some effort. There's some work that has to go into this. I will meditate on your precepts. I will meditate on your laws, the things that you've said are right. And I will fix my eyes on your ways. We want to embrace God and what he is promising. That's the effort that has to go in. It's not that we're going to be perfect. It's not that we're going to make, uh, not make mistakes. That's a given. It's the one that endures through patience. It's the one that overcomes. It's the one that says, okay, i got to pick myself back up and keep moving. We saw that, right? That was the instruction from Paul. I strain forward. I let the things that happened in the past, because I can't change them. They're done. I have to strain forward. I have to keep moving towards that prize. That's what athletes do. That's what we're instructed, and as an example given, that's what Jesus did. We can't forget what he did. I didn't put it on the slide today, um, but if you read Second Peter uh, chapter 1, you can take some time and see exactly what effort Jesus made for us. Excuse me, I, I meant to say Second Peter 2, uh, 14 through 25. That is a great reading, a reminder to all of us that this is why we're doing this, because our Lord and Savior set that example. Acts 17, 10, and 11, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. When we take a step back, if we look back at the beginning of this chapter in Acts 17, there were bad characters around Paul. There were lots of things going on in this area that he was at, and it was hampering his ability to, to speak God's truth. These bad characters were creating problems for God's Word. So what was done was they... they 
They whisked him away and took him to a synagogue where they could get a little relief and a little space. And as they were speaking there, these Jews were looking at what? They were looking at the scriptures. To do what? They wanted to, to understand what was being said and compare it and make sure it was true. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Exercise, self-discipline, and a commitment to feed yourself, right? These are the things that they were doing. These are the things that are exemplified for us. And when people come along and they say, hey, I've got this message. It's hopeful. It's this. It's that. It's the truth. We have the scriptures like they did to say, wait a minute, is that really the truth? That's an excellent spot to be in, but you have to choose that. You have to have that discipline, that ability and commitment to do that. I hope you understand that I'm pointing at myself when I say you. Okay, that's, that's good. Job 23.12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. And yes, I did go back and make sure that was Job saying that and not some of his friends. Job, if we can remember what happened to him, the test that was put before him and the suffering that he had to go through is uh, an important part of recognizing what he chose, right? He said, no matter what God has in mind, I'm not going to stop believing and trusting in him. And boy, he, he got ran through the ringer, as they say. Satan really got to put a number on him. And he makes this very powerful statement, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. He put that in front of it, the idea that the promise was there, it was real, and he used that as a way to cope and work through the problem, the test that he was in. And we are all tested, some of us in different ways than others, but it is God that is making sure that we understand the truth and Satan is out there to sift us, right? That's his role. And so we want to make sure we're prepared for handling that. That's exactly what Job was dealing with here. He was making these choices and he made this, this very powerful statement and I'm sure it may not, may not have been easy to say, but that's what we do. We say to ourselves, well, what's the truth here? What am I supposed to do? That's that training. That's that self-discipline, that commitment. Take a deep breath. So we ask ourselves, why must we endure with patience? Why? Why has this got to happen this way? Why couldn't God have just made it great and easy? and we'd all be in great shape. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The message of the kingdom that's coming is a choice that we have to embrace. God, in His infinite wisdom, he set things up so that we have to make that choice. And if we don't choose anything, we still made a choice. Because as we talked about in the adult class, you're out if you don't do what's right, if you don't embrace the plan. And Paul puts it in terms here, fight the good fight of faith. Yeah, there's a lot of fighting going on in this world for lots of different things. There's politics you can fight for. There's community-driven events. There's all sorts of things you can fight for. But we want to talk about the things that bring eternal life, that bring us salvation, a better life. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Everyone's called, but people have to choose that calling. They have to say, I want to believe that. I want to have that. And that's this good confession. We say that in front of our brothers and sisters. We say it at baptism at the start. Why? Because you have to say it 
so that you can take the actions. And the people that hear you say it can say, yeah, remember when you said that? That was important. <laughs> That's when you started your path. And sometimes we have to be brought back to that, me. We have to be brought to that moment and we go, why did I say that? Well, I want to have and partake in this eternal life. Revelation 21.7 says, The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The one that conquers. That's the overcoming. That's the endurance. Going to fight that good fight. Hebrews 11.6, another common text that we bring up here for good reason. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligence is another word that means work, right? It's, I've got to work at this. He is a rewarder of those that work at it. But you have to believe in him, you have to understand the message, and you have to say, yes, I want to be a partaker in that. 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear, come into my rest. I want to hear, you're healed, you're fixed, your wound is gone. You can live now in this life that I have set up for you. But that's the choice that we have to put before us. That's the commitment we have to make. That's the self-discipline we have to apply. We have to change our heart and our mind so that we can partake in that. We want to receive that rich welcome. We know when we go into a, a building or a place, and if the place is all shuttered up and dark, and it's not welcoming. But we see God's plan as something that's a, a, a welcome for all, but you have to choose it. You have to say, I want to partake in that. Thank you. And let's turn to song number 63, farther along. Number 63. And let's stand, please.
heaven, we are indeed grateful once again for the time that we can step aside from the world and think about you, to consider all the words that you presented to us, the plan that you have set up to bring about righteousness and your will on this earth. Forgive us when we fail and fall short of your will and expectations. Help us to always consider the examples that have come before us, especially your son who gave his life on the cross for us. We're grateful for answered prayer in our lives. And as we go about the rest of this day, that we would consider you in all things, to consider the fact that there are challenges around us and to be ready to give an answer whenever there is a need. Give us strength the days to come until your son's return. And may we all hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name.